Welcome back to our final session of the Fifth Belt and Road Conference. We are now going to talk about how do we deal with currency, payment issues, and digital assets in negotiating and enforcing contracts. Some people have their new digital identity and persona, which they use to interact and conduct business in the cyber world. The panel will discuss the practical issues faced by professionals around the world in dealing with cryptocurrency and payment issues and digital assets in negotiating and enforcing contracts. May we now invite the moderator, Mr. Rodin Tong, Vice President of the Law Society of Hong Kong. Rodin, please. Please may we also invite our honorable guests, um, the Senior Legal Officer at the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law of Unidrot, Mr. William Bridey Watson. We also have with us the Under Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury, the Government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China, Mr. Joseph Chan Ho Yim, JP. We have the Law Officer, International Law of the Department of Justice, the government of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China, Dr. James Ding. And lastly, we have the General Counsel of Finance, Mr. Hong Ng. Thank you. Thank you, Hien. Peston, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, fellow members. So here we come to our final session of the day. So last but certainly not least, this session will look into a very practical topic on how to deal with currency, payment issues, and digital assets in negotiating and enforcing contracts. One of the practical issues faced by professionals around the world. So today, we have a very strong panel actually with us. So we have a distinguished speaker from Department of Justice. We have a distinguished speaker from the government, and also a speaker from an international organization and also from a private sector. So stay tuned on hear what they are going to share with us. So without further ado, may I first introduce Dr. James Deng. Dr. James Deng is the law officer, international law of the Department of Justice, the government of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region he has the International Law Division and reports to the Secretary for Justice on issues of international law and international legal cooperation. Dr. Ding is also currently the chair of APAT Economic Committee. He taught law on a part-time basis from 1998 to 1999 and has published on different subjects of international law and international cooperation. He has been awarded with the Chief Executive's Commendation for Government Public Service in 2021. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Deng to give his first speech. Dr. Deng. Thank you, Odin. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the Law Society of Hong Kong for organizing the fifth uh, Belt and Road Conference, focusing on legal issues surrounding technological developments under the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, and also for inviting me to join this uh, very important panel sessions. As we have heard from our earlier sessions, technological innovations have transformed the global economies and brought new opportunities at the same time. The BRI has promoted cross-border trade, including trade in digital assets. Inevitably, legal practitioners will be faced with local legal and practical issues when advising their clients on cross-border transactions involving digital assets. I would like to share with you today some of the recent international developments with reference to the ongoing work by various regional and international organizations. First of all, let's start with the concept of data and digital assets. In its ongoing work on a taxonomy of emergency technologies, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNCTRAD, 
has defined the data as representations of information in electronic form. Given the various forms of contracts dealing with data, Ansichow has attempted to draw a distinction between two types of data contracts, namely data provision contracts, which involve a person providing data to another person for the other person to use or otherwise process, and data processing contracts, which involve a person processing data for another person and providing the process data to the other person. A closely related concept to data is digital assets. The International Institute for the Unification of Prime Non-Unit Drought has defined digital assets as an electronic record which is capable of being subject to control in the drought principles being developed under the Unit Drought's Digital Assets and Prime Non Project. Uh, we have a distinguished speakers from Unit Drought with us on this panel, so I will not need to further elaborate, I will just defer to his explanations later. For Ansichow, it considers digital assets to be a collection of the data stored electronically that's of use or valued. Ansichow highlighted two types of digital assets in his work. One is digital assets that represent intrinsic value owing to the rules of the systems in which they exist, sometimes referred to as payments token, for example, cryptocurrency. The other type of digital assets is those that represent value owing to their connection to some real world tangible or intangible assets, such as goods or ways in goods, receivable and otherwise, which connections is established by the rules of systems in which they exist. A common form of such digital assets is assets back tokens. The unique characteristics of the data, digital assets, and the digital world have prompted us to ponder on adequacy of our laws, such as contract law, property law, and private international law, in dealing with data, digital assets, and other emerging concepts in the digital world. Just to name a few key challenges that we may face, while Ansichal and Unichal have started working on the terms, there's still no universally agreed definitions or characterizations of data and digital assets. This may lead to legal uncertainty, particularly in cross-border transactions, as legal issues and principles may vary across different types of digital assets in different jurisdictions. Another challenge is that the digital economies involve emerging, rapidly evolving technology. Hence, our laws may not be able to keep up with the constantly changing landscape and advancement in technology. Data and digital assets are intangible and long rival in nature, meaning that the same data can be used simultaneously or over time without exhaustion. Our existing law on sale of goods and property law may not be easily applicable in such cases. Transactions may occur without a physical location. Apart from the difficulty in characterizing such transactions, there also may be difficulties in determining the applicable law given the absence of our physical locations. When we come to enforcement, pseudonymity or anonymity of users in the digital world and the decentralized natures of digital economies may also pose further difficulties in identifying the parties involved and enforcing the rights. All these uncertainties in applicable legal rules undermine predictability and present many challenges to lawyers. In the Digital Economy Report 2021 of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNTAC, there are some useful observations on tackling some of these challenges. In view of the characteristics of the data, UNTAC looked at data need to be treated differently from convenient conventional goods and services. Rather than trying to determine who owns the data, what matters is who has the right to access, control, and use the data. Legal practitioners should take particular cautions in advising on the rights to access, control, and use the data, which are core parts of contracts involving data and digital assets. The borderless and openness of the digital space has ruled the line of territorial boundaries. Data can be better understood as shared rather than as traded or exchanged. Approaches applied to international trade cannot be easily applied to data.
The general pet and practical observation by UNTAC are useful, but we also need to find more concrete and specific means to deal with the challenges. In these connections, the ANSI trial has been developing a taxonomy of evasion technologies and their applications covering the following areas, artificial intelligence, distributed ledger systems, smart contracts, digital assets, data transactions, online platforms, and display solutions. In ANSI trial's work, it has emphasized on technology, neutrality, neutrality, party autonomy, and transparency. For data transactions, there are also discussions of whether the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the Intentional Sale of Goods, CIG, may be applicable to data provisions contracts or serve as a possible source of inspiration for future work on data provision contracts. It has been suggested that the notes on the main issues of cloud computing contracts of Ancestral may be helpful in dealing with some legal issues arising from data processing contracts. For digital assets, Ancestral is considering the relevance of the following tax to digital assets, the model law on electronic transferable records, the model law on electronic commerce, the CSG, and Ancestral model law on insolvency. Earlier, I mentioned uh, CSG. Uh, as you may be aware, CSG will become applicable to Hong Kong uh, with effects from the 1st of December this year. The sales of goods United Nations Conventions Ordinance will come into operations on the same date. In, this, in the context of digital economies, as observed by in Ancestral's work so far, there are a number of issues for considerations when con considering whether CSG may be applied. Are data or digital assets regarded as goods? Are data or digital assets contractions, contracts of sale? Does payments of cryptocurrencies constitute payments of the price? Are provisions of the CIG appropriate for transactions involving data or digital assets? Can the provisions be suitably adapted? There may not be clear answer to all these questions. Legal practitioners should consider the above issues when advising their clients in specific cases. In addition to the above, ANSI trial also closely collaborated with Unidraft on the project of digital assets and private law. Unidraft is studying and working on the future legal instruments containing principles and legislative guidance in the area of private law and digital assets. The principles include the subject of private industrial law issues, control, transfer, custody, secret transactions, enforcement, and insolvency, etc. I'm sure you'll hear more from Will later on. The head conference on prior international law, HCCH, is also examining the issues of prior international law which are relevant to the digital economies. In particular, their work on the following areas may be of particular relevance. Jurisdictions and choice of court, applicable law and choice of law, recognition and enforcement, and cross-border and cross-platform cooperation mechanisms. Petitioners may wish to keep abreast of exclusive work, which may be useful for advising clients on cross-border transactions involving data and digital assets. Apart from the work of the three sisters organizations that I just mentioned, I would also like to introduce some relevant initiatives of regional organizations such as the APEC Pacific, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC. In 2018, the Digital Economy Steering Group and the APEC was established to facilitate the development of the internet and digital economy, including e-commerce and digital trade, guided by the internet and digital economy roadmap. The roadmap is a framework that provides guidance on key areas and actions to facilitate technological and policy exchanges among member economies and to promote innovative, inclusive, and sustainable growth, as well as to bridge digital divide in the APEC region. The focus area of work as set out in the roadmap include development of holistic government policy framework for the internet and digital economy, promoting coherence and cooperation of regulatory approaches affecting the internet and digital economy, enhancing trust and security in the use of information and communication technology, facilitating the free flow of information and data for the development of the internet and digital economies, while respecting applicable domestic laws and regulations, and facilitations of e-commerce and advancing cooperation on digital trade. One of the concrete deliverables by APEC in respect 
In response to digital economy is the APEC collaborative framework for online dispute resolutions of cross-border business-to-business disputes, which has also been mentioned by our Secretary for Justice this morning. The framework has been launched this year with a list of ODL service providers from APEC economies, including EBAM Center from Hong Kong, China. As recognized by the United Nations, online dispute resolutions can assist parties in resolving the disputes in a simple, fast, flexible, and secure manner without the need for physical presence at a meeting or hearing. Utilizing modern technologies, ODL provides the means for resolving cross-border disputes in an expeditious, convenient, cost-effective, and secure manner. ODL may be a good option for dispute resolutions in the context of data transactions or digital access transactions. Petitioners may consider advising their clients to use ODL as a possible means for resolving such disputes. Talking about ODL, I should also mention the Asian African Legal Conservative Organizations, ELCO Hong Kong Regional Arbitration Center, which was opened in May this year. The center also offers ODL platforms and technology for handling disputes, including those involving digital assets. In fact, ELCO is also working on various areas of international law relevant to the digital world. For example, it has established a working group on international law in cyberspace. Petitioner may wish to keep track of his work by reference to the relevant report accessible on the website of ELCO. As you can see my presentations about, there's no ready answer to the questions surrounding digital assets. Various international organizations are continuing their work in the relevant areas. Petitioners may wish to keep abreast of their ongoing work and may also exchange views and participate in discussions at the relevant forums or events, including at our conference today. That concludes my presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ding, for your latest uh, legislation uh, and also the digital economy will measure. So now, so here we come that uh, we would like to invite someone, distinguished speaker from the international organization, Mr. William Ryder Russian. Mr. Russian is the senior legal officer of the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law. He specialized in secure transactions law and private international law, and lectures on international security transaction law at the Uteros Norwell Faculty of Law in Budapest. At the Institute, he is responsible for the implementation of the mining, agriculture, and construction to the 2001 Cape Town Convention on International Interests in Mobile Equipment and the development of a model law on factoring. He also serves as the Institute's liaison with the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum and as manager of the scholarship and the internship programs. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Watson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here to speak on this last distinguished panel that's covering some extremely interesting issues. As noted in my introduction, I have a very specific role in this panel. I can't speak to regulatory issues. I can't speak to whether we should introduce uh, digital assets or cryptocurrencies as national currencies, because I'm not a regulator, nor can I speak to uh, practical issues of using crypto assets to facilitate goods and services transactions uh, because I've never used a crypto asset to uh, facilitate a financial transaction along, along the Belt and Road Initiative. But there is some value in me speaking here in that I do have experience in the use and value of international instruments to improve legal certainty 
and lay a solid foundation and framework for international legal relationships and uh, along the Belt and Road. So I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes focusing on these particular value adds that Unidua has. So as an officer of an international legislative organisation, when I approach a question like how do we deal with currency payment issues and digital assets in negoti negotiating and enforcing contracts, of course my answer is naturally international instruments negotiated by independent intergovernmental organisations such as UNIDWA. That's naturally our response, but we, we also believe in the work we do. As outlined by James in the first, uh, in his presentation, uh, there are a range of instruments negotiated by the three sisters of private international law, UNIDWA, UNCITRAL, and the Hague Conference that we believe would uh, address many of the concerns and many of the issues raised today. So I'd like to make uh, three points in my, in my brief presentation. Uh, the first being the essential use of international instruments in relation to these issues because of the inherently international nature and use of uh, cryptocurrencies and payment issues in cross-border trade between countries. Second, I'd like to talk about, uh, it, it's more of a categorisation of some of the different instruments that James spoke of. Um, and trying to understand the different instruments that are available and how they can be used throughout the life cycle of a relationship between different companies involved in uh, international trade and provision of services in different countries. And then finally I'd like to conclude with a reflection on both uh, the, the use of existing instruments and new international developments with an emphasis on the point that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and that many of the international instruments that already exist and successfully regulate uh, international uh, trade and commerce can to a large extent be used in relation to these new emerging technologies. So my first point is in relation to the essential use of international instruments. So as we all know, the uh, BRI is a global initiative requiring cross-border transactions and therefore the need of clear conflict of law rules. Now that goes without saying. The, what, what is, this is particularly relevant in relation to the use of digital currencies, which are inherently more cross-border than other, uh, other types of currencies that have been used in the past, which are inherently tied to the country that were, was issuing the currency, the fiat currencies, whereas of course with digital currencies they may not be issued in a particular place, they may not be issued by a government, so there are, I would posit, even greater risk, or there's greater transna uh, transnational issues that arise in relation to digital assets as compared to uh, existing fiat currencies. The, the other value of international instruments negotiated at intergovernmental independent organisations such as UNIDWA is they reflect a balanced uh, principle that reflects different approaches in common law systems, in civil law systems, and it's important to emphasise the negotiation uh, process in relation to these instruments are often over many, many years involving governments from around the world, experts uh, at various levels of the private, we include the private sector in these negotiations. So what comes out at the end of this process for a treaty which can take up to seven or eight years, or soft law which takes a, a few less years, is that you have a balanced instrument that should be able to be utilised in different countries and in different contexts. Now the reason I'm emphasising this is that in the in, in the absence of these international instruments, occasionally uh, private sector associations or, uh, or non-international intergovernmental organisations try to develop different codes, and these are very, very va valuable in sort of guiding practice, but they can't replace the inherent value of having a properly harmonised, uh, uh, properly negotiated um, instrument that reflects a settled position between different governments who might otherwise have different ideas. And finally, the point, the, the, the final point I'd make in, is that often uh, we hear, oh, the, you know, international instruments might stifle private sector creativity or might actually court be, be a break on the use of emerging technology in different jurisdictions. And I would, I would actually take a, a, the converse approach to that, in that. I, I would suspect that if, if I was working for Binance or for a, for a large, uh, large cross-border um, 
uh, company that's wanting to operate in different jurisdictions, if you have legal certainty in relation to the regulatory framework in these different countries and you're aware of the legal rules that are likely to apply to the emerging technologies that you're creating, that allows you to create solutions that can be utilised in different countries and not have to take a country-by-country -country approach. So I would argue that actually international instruments facilitate and assist international uh, companies in operating internationally rather than impose some sort of, um, some sort of break on, on innovation. So this slide sets out many of the instruments that James mentioned in his first presentation. And I, what I tried to do in, in preparing this slide was uh, sort of reorder them in terms of not by organisation, but in terms of the life cycle, life cycle of legal relationships between, uh, uh, between companies. So most of the new work is going on in relation to the creation or the substantive rules in relation to these new assets. What is data? What is a digital asset? What do we mean when we say money? What do we mean when we say receivable? So these are the substantive rules that are essential, the central part to when companies are, uh, are making an international contract in relation to goods or services, they note that they're using common terms and there is a, a clear legal meaning for, for the asset that we're talking about. Um, and as James mentioned in relation to digital assets and data, these are ongoing works in both of these four. There are not yet established uh, internationally recognised definitions for these, but they should be in 12 months' time from now, so we're not too far away. In relation to the contracting, is that there is a plethora of uh, international instruments that already exist that, that address many of the issues that have been discussed today. Obviously, the, the UNIDWI uh, principles and international commercial contracts, as well as UNCTAD trials uh, convention, the international sale of goods. Most of these rules, I'll mention in my final slide, already address uh, many of the issues that have um, been raised today. Perhaps they need to be reinterpreted in the light of new emerging technologies, but I would say let's not, to use a, a strange colloquialism, let's, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Many of these instruments can still be used, and even though they've been negotiated 20 or 30 years ago, well before the proliferation of these new technologies, they, over time, technology has changed many times since the PIC was first negotiated in 1994, yet they're still relevant and they're used every day in international, in international disputes, especially in arbitration. So to say that now all of a sudden that they cannot be applied and they're no longer relevant, I think is probably uh, a, a, a stretch. Um, there's also particular rules in dispute and enforcement. I would highlight you need to ask current work on, uh, on effective enforcement across borders, um, which is also a work in progress, but hopefully will be finished next year. And there are, of course, regulatory, regulatory issues to be addressed. They aren't handled by UNIDWA, but there is uh, international intergovernmental organisations working on these regulatory issues at all. So there is an international framework on these issues. It's not like we're operating in limbo. So my final point is, yes, clearly there are, there are the necessity for some new rules, which is why they're being developed, particularly in, the relation, in relation to the, the categorisation and treatment of digital assets. So what is a digital asset, how you perfect your, well, you know, with, with reference to control, uh, the, the, private, the conflict of laws rules in relation to those, what is data, how do you deal with data. However, in most cases, I would argue, existing international states facilitating cross-border contracting, trade, border and finance are still applicable. There's no need to catch up to the technology train. We just need to reinterpret what's already out there. Because these international instruments have been negotiated using the concept of te uh, technological neutrality, it doesn't matter what the technology, how the technology emerges, it, uh, these, these older instruments will still apply. Of course, in practice, this could be very challenging, but as, as I've mentioned, over, over the past decades, by and large, these, inter, these uh, international instruments have still served their purpose in regulating cross-border legal relationships and the provision of finance. One particular example I can use here is in, in the model law on factoring, which we're currently um, uh, preparing at UNIDWA, which will be negotiated and finalised next year. We, talk to, we define a receivable in Article 2 as a contractual right to payment for a sum of money. And when, we, when we're addressing this issue in the Guide to Enactment, we're making it very clear that when we mean money, we don't mean fiat currencies. We mean uh, anything that can be used as a medium of, of uh, trade and that it would absolutely apply to cryptocurrencies and other, other digital assets as well. So um, 
so I, I think it's, we're, we're already ensuring that the, the instruments we're developing now and the interpretation of past instruments address these technological issues. I think that is my uh, 10 minutes, so thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion following the panel. Thank you. Thank you, William. Now, another distinguished panelist with us today is uh, Mr. Joseph Chen Ho Lim. He is the Under Secretary for Financial Service and the Treasury, the government of the Hong Kong SAO. Mr. Chen has many years of senior executive experience in the banking industry. He was the Managing Director in the Global Market Divisions of Credit, Archico, Corporate and Investment Bank and in financial markets of Standard Chartered Bank. Prior to joining the government, Mr. Chen held multiple roles in a number of public and professional bodies, including Vice President of the Hong Kong Society of Financial Analysts, Director of Hong Kong Securities and Investment Institute, Advisor of the Chinese Gold and Silver Exchange Society, as well as a general committee member of Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce. So, Mr. Chan, please, thank you. Thank you. It's great seeing you here today, and my pleasure to have uh, the next 10 minutes to share with you about our um, view on um, the virtual assets uh, development or so. Well, to begin with, um, like what James mentioned early on, I think at the moment, universally, there, there, there's no universal agreement on the definition of um, digital asset per se. Right? Uh, if you look at the industry, legal framework, regulatory framework, there's no universal agreement on that. And in What's our definition? What's the definition of digital assets? That could be STOs, could be stable coins, could be ICOs, could be cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, could be CBDC, central bank digital currencies, and, and uh, can be NFTs, so on and so forth. And it's not only about the definition that uh, required uh, more understanding and regulatory framework, but also the related um, downstream services such as the exchanges such as the issuer's uh, role, such as the custodian services. And also, it involves other type of related products, financial products, such as funds, derivatives, and also the institution involved, such as intermediaries as well. So it is very, I would say the landscape is very dynamic and evolving. But one thing is certain um, is that if we look at the um, development of the DLT, uh, also the blockchain technology, right? It offers financial innovation, it, it improves cost efficiency, and also inclusiveness as well. So uh, we reckon virtual assets business is here to stay, and is also offering opportunities related to Web 3.0 and Metaverse. And in light of this, the Hong Kong SL government um, last, uh, last week issued a policy statement on development of virtual assets in Hong Kong. Our vision and approach uh, is that Hong Kong is open and inclusive towards the global community of innovators engaging in virtual asset business. We will provide a facilitating environment for promoting sustainable and responsible development of the virtual asset sector in Hong Kong. And we will also offer timely and necessary guardrails to mitigate the actual or potential risks in line with international standards as well. If we look at the policy statement, um, in terms of regulation, our objective right, is to uh, with is to offer consistency, predictability, and clarity gradually through establishing a regulatory framework. And that will offer a solid foundation to further embrace financial innovations and technological development brought by the rapid development of the virtual assets business globally. Uh, in, that, uh, in that policy statement, a few areas I would like to share with you about our regulations uh, 
uh, current form and also the future direction. First is that uh, we are setting up the new licensing regime for virtual asset service provider. Uh, for this regime, the definition of virtual asset, we are making reference to the definition under FedEx Financial Action Task Force. So the new regime will align requirements for virtual asset exchanges in terms of anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing as well as investor protection as well to those currently applicable to traditional financial institutions, hence offering licensed virtual asset exchanges that status and credibility to access a wider net of investors in the Hong Kong market. The other one about regulation is exchange traded funds ETFs on virtual assets in our market in Hong Kong here. So uh, we, we are open to the possibility of having ETFs on virtual asset in Hong Kong, and subsequently last week, the SFC has also issued a circular on this uh, to share with the industry our current, um, uh, our, our current guidelines on ETFs on virtual asset futures, and also the potential future development in terms of offering more potential virtual asset underlying for ETFs to link with and to link to in the future. The other element in our regulations is that uh, we will do a public consultation on how retail investors may be given a suitable degree of access to virtual assets. And to be precise, uh, the upcoming licensing regime for virtual asset service providers or virtual asset exchanges will be confined to professional investors only. But we will, uh, through SFC, conduct a public consultation on how we can offer access to retail investors with uh, un uh, under the new licensing regime, but given certain degree of um, measures to protect investor protection, particularly for the retail investors as well. And also uh, in the statement, we touch on the regulatory regime for stable coin. Basically, on stablecoin, our uh, central bank or the banking regulator, HKMA, has already issued a discussion paper on this subject uh, to seek the industry and public's feedback on putting in place a risk-based, proportionate, an agile regime for regulating activities related to payment-related stable coins. Now, uh, HKMA is actually studying the feedback already collected, and the consultation outcome and the next steps will be announced in due course. And the fifth point I would like to share with you from the regulation side is that uh, we will conduct review on property rights for tokenized assets and the legality of smart contracts as well. Apart from regulations, we also want to demonstrate our commitment and also open in exploring uh, the technological benefits brought by virtual assets through three different pilot projects. One is this last week for our FinTech Week, we have uh, issued non-fungible tokens, uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, for the participant of uh, FinTech Week, so as to demonstrate our, our engagement with the fintech and the web street community as a proof of concept project we also announced that uh, we will tokenize our future government green bond issuance for subscription by institutional investors that will cover us in terms of the bond the future government green bond insurance the life cycle settlement uh, the redemption payment so on and so forth and also, uh, we announced that uh, we'll continue to push forward in terms of studying the development of eHKD, the electronic form of Hong Kong dollar as a central bank digital currency to be applied locally here in Hong Kong. And all in all, I think our spirit um, for the policy statement, well, is that uh, we are talking about the government, um, in conjunction with our financial regulators, are working towards to provide a facilitating environment for promoting sustainable and development of virtual asset sector in Hong Kong. And I think uh, making um, reference as well um, to um, just now what William said, uh, is technolo technology neutral approach. So meaning that we will adopt the same activity same risk, same regulation principle to put in place timely and necessary guardrails so that the potential risk on financial stability, consumer protection, as well as money laundering and terrorist financing uh, risks can be mitigated and managed in line with international standards. 
Just now, I mentioned central bank digital currency, or e Hong Kong dollar. So quickly, I want to share with you uh, that uh, we adopt a proactive and open-minded approach in terms of uh, the issuance and application of CBDC. And um, in fact, in September, the HKMA already released a position paper on e Hong Kong dollar. How we're going to move forward on that? So basically, we set out three rails. Uh, first. Uh, is to develop the necessary technological framework and legal foundation for implementation. Second rail is to examine the actual use cases and implementation details of e-Hong Kong dollar. We will conduct both uh, the first rail and the second rail in parallel, at the same time concurrently. And after finishing these two rails, then we will look into the third rail, which is to set a timeline for the actual launching of e Hong Kong dollar, taking into account the pace of the local and the international market's development on CBDC. Well, for the um, Belt and Road um, initiatives, we see that increasingly uh, offshore RMB um, has been used in terms of infrastructure financing and also trade finance as well. Well, Hong Kong, we are already the biggest offshore RMB center in the world. We possess the biggest offshore RMB liquidity in the world, and also we uh, uh, we process around 75% of offshore RMB payments at the moment. So that's why the development of ECNY, electronic uh, uh, RMB, uh, will also be uh, very important uh, to our role in terms of facilitating the internalization of RMB and also facilitating the um, offshore RMB flow within uh, the Belt and Road um, region as well. So HKMA has been working with the Digital Currency Institute of People's Bank of China to expand the scope and scale of technical testing of using ECNY in cross-boundary payments uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, we have completed the first phase of technological testing already. We are now in the second phase on technical testing, uh, including the top-up of ECNY wallet through faster payment system, our own uh, digital infrastructure in Hong Kong, and also we are inviting more participants as in banks and merchants to participate in the testing as well. Uh, we believe that the use of ECNY will offer additional means which is safe, convenient and innovative for cross-boundary retail consumption to residents in Hong Kong and mainland as well. And of course, by doing so, it will help promote uh, the fund flow or, or mutual access within the Greater Bay Area and also further consolidate Hong Kong's status as the global offshore renminbi business hub. Of course, talking about the Bell and Road region, um, we should look beyond uh, cross-boundary payments between Hong Kong and mainland market, but also other economies or jurisdiction uh, in the Bell and Road region. So indeed, we are also looking into uh, the CBDC cross-border uh, application within the Bell and Road uh, region as well, um, so that it will help facilitate capital flow for trade and investments in the region. So the HKMA is conducting the multiple CBDC bridge project uh, in collaboration with PBOC, uh, also at the Bank of Thailand, the Central Bank of the UAE, and also the Bank for International Settlements Innovation Hub Center here in Hong Kong to explore the capabilities of distributed ledger technology, DLT, in facilitating real-time cross-border foreign exchange payment versus payment transactions. Well, we reckon the Enbridge trial platform addresses the principal pain points of the current cross-border payments in international trade settlement that we always experience uh, within our um, uh, business activities within the uh, uh, Belt and Road um, uh, region, uh, including high cost, low speed, operational complexities, while also ensuring the policy regulatory compliance and privacy mechanisms are appropriately integrated. So we believe that um, definitely the development and promotion of um, cross-border CBDC transaction can address these um, issues. Well, on that, I would like to say that in terms of our overall um, policy statement, the fundamentals are, um, are that we are embracing the technology on terms of DLT and blockchain, but we need to use them in facilitating the real growth of our real economy. And um, at the same time, as I mentioned earlier on, there will be various types of risks associated. At the end of the day, we are talking about walking into uncharted water 
in terms of the development of virtual assets for the financial world. So it won't be straightforward. It involves considerable risk uh, uh, throughout the process, but we believe that by monitoring the development very closely, by putting in timely and necessary guardrails, we can facilitate responsible and sustainable development of the virtual asset business. And on that note, I will conclude my presentation and I look forward to the Q&A sessions on these subjects. Thank you. Thank you, Under Secretary, Mr. Joseph Chen, for sharing with us uh, such an in-depth and comprehensive policy statement uh, from the government. It appears that uh, there's a lot that the Hong Kong government will do on this uh, digital asset world. So now comes to the uh, final panelist. So he's uh, from private sector. Mr. Hon mm is also with us today. He's the general counsel at Binance and he leads the company's legal department and works closely with the company's compliance, government affairs and policy and business teams to handle legal matters on blockchain and web-free space, as well as constructively engaging regulators around the world. Prior to joining Binance, Wisdom was the legal director at Uber Technologies Incorporation and an attorney with leading international law firms. So, please join me in welcoming Hon. Thank you very much. Um, so, for those who have been following what's been going on in the market, it's been a very busy 48 hours. Um, and happy to kind of engage on the Q&A as well. But, um, you know, I think the, the last 48 hours have been um, quite revealing. Um, I think it quite instructive as well. Um, we've certainly been busy. Um, I was up until quite early this morning trying to figure a few things out. So um, happy to engage in that uh, in a moment. But as someone from Hong Kong, um, with parents from Hong Kong, grandparents from Hong Kong, and myself from Hong Kong, I'm actually very excited by, about the changes that the Hong Kong government is making in the policy space because for me, as someone dealing with international government affairs and, and policy and knowing and, and dealing with governments very intimately, um, I actually think the new policy changes are extremely exciting. We're actually thrilled to see that, so thank you for taking that bold step. I do think, and I'm slightly biased, I do think it will help Hong Kong uh, become a digital asset hub uh, in the region and internationally. So, uh, you know, that's credit to the government there. Um, let me just move to the three things I'm going to cover. Um, this topic really excites me because, you know, um, we have our distinguished panelists talking about really the black letter law and, and how to apply it in not only the real world but also the digital world. And I find that really exciting because, you know, it takes me back to my university days about you know, applying case law from 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it's still relevant. And I think um, what's, what's really interesting is that the, the, the more I work in this digital space, the more relevant this, uh, this, this body of law becomes. And I wanted to cover three areas, uh, a brief introduction to this digital space, uh, in particular smart contracts, uh, about the topic of how it helps the Belt and Road Initiative, and then five issues that I think um, that we need to think about in relation to smart contracts. And then finally, uh, looking ahead um, about what's happening. Um, oops, sorry. For those who are not familiar with Binance, uh, we are the largest uh, crypto exchange in the world. Um, we uh, cover quite a lot of countries and um, happy to, again, describe more about the company, but it's not really about the company. It's really about the, the industry here. Um, we can see here that the market capitalization of cryptocurrency has grown. Uh, this chart only shows up to April 2022, uh, which is just before um, the, what we call the crypto winter, which is a bit of a crash in, in terms of the market capitalization. So that number will, will, will have dropped. Um, but it did top up at an all-time high of $3 trillion. Um, while that seems very high, if you can see the trend, it is trending up. It's actually a very, very low 
part of the overall uh, financial market. Uh, you can see here that we think the penetration rate is about 3.9% of um, the adoption. But we do think that wider adoption is going to happen, particularly in Asia and, and Africa. If we look at how this represents in relation to bonds, stocks, gold, and also the largest market cap companies in the S&P 500, we can see that cryptocurrency is actually a very, very small part of the entire ecosystem. However, it's growing. Um, it has a lot of space to grow, and I think this, this is where regulation and, and good law comes in, right? To, because in order to grow in a safe and regulated manner, we need good regulations, we need developed laws around this space. And I think from listening to my distinguished panelists, um, I'm very confident that we'll get there in Hong Kong. And finally, just uh, a final slide on the introduction. Stable coins is, is quite a big topic. We, um, as a company, Binance actually um, consulted with the HKMA on stable coins. So we were very uh, honored to, to be um, uh, reached out to, and we, we tried to give uh, as reasonable opinions as possible to, to help the development of stable coins in Hong Kong. Um, we actually uh, issue through Paxos, which is a regulated um, player in New York, um, the world's second largest stable coin. It's, um, I think it's number five kind of most widely held cryptocurrency in the world. Um, and you can see that the market cap of the entire stable coin community is really a small percentage of the entire money, money flow supply around the world. So again, it's an interesting fact because there is a lot of space to grow, um, but we can see here the, the, the kind of context in which we're, we're talking about here. And finally, the estimates of crypto users is around 300 million at the moment. Um, we think that that will grow, um, but it will take another cycle for that to grow into the mainstream. And, and the mainstream is really where the growth is going forward. So that's a story of kind of where we are, which is we're really at the start of this exciting financial evolution. Um, and talking about smart contracts, which is the topic of this uh, conversation here, um, I do see five issues that we see in the private sector um, in relation to this. One is how do you enforce these smart contracts? You know, you don't know that, you know, it typically a smart contract, for those who don't know, is a set of code. It's a code of ifs and when, uh, and, you know, if that happens, then it's executed. But sometimes things go wrong. Um, you can have coding errors, and you have two counterparties who don't feel like they've got what they bargained for. Then, then what happens? And I think, you know, an important part of this is KYC and counterparty identification. Um, at its infancy, this, the crypto exchange world um, really didn't focus on this. And in some ways, we need to take a leaf out of the banking world, right? Uh, KYC is extremely important. You cannot enforce, you cannot know what you're doing unless you know who the counterparty party is. So number one is counterparty identification is super important. And for us, we were one of the largest exchanges that actually started to, started to apply this uh, worldwide. Um, second is cross-border disputes. Um, so do we use the same rules or do we have new rules? Um, this is a conflict of law question. Um, there's obviously issues around standardization, which is what the panelists have discussed already. Um, it is an extremely interesting area. Um, in traditional contract law, you know who your counterparty is, you know where they sit, you have a contract, you may have a choice of law provision, you may have a, um, a court provision. In a smart contract, you don't have those things. Um, and then if you go back to traditional legal analysis, then where is the contract executed? Where is performance? And so this is very interesting because in a digital world, um, sometimes you go back to where the servers are, where the servers are located. Where is predominantly the counterparty? If they're around the world, where, where do they have substance? And I think these are just super interesting questions around cross-border disputes for smart contracts that the legal world, legal community here amongst us have to deal with. Number three is um, asset freezes. Um, obviously, you need to enforce potentially a court order. How do you do that? Um, for us as a company, we, we've actually dealt with um, 27, over 27,000 uh, uh, law enforcement uh, requests and help law enforcement since 2021. Our policy is to help. So we don't have an official, um, uh, sometimes we don't need an official kind of uh, court papers. We, we help because we feel like we need to. Um, and sometimes we do go, go through, you know, the MLAT processes, et cetera. 
established processes in international law. But we are here to help, and, and I think law enforcement have, have appreciated that. Um, number four is data privacy, which is super interesting because there's a tension between data privacy and the notion of a right to forget. Um, so under uh, GDPR rules, right to forget is, is, a, is, a, is a core principle. But under blockchain, it's all about transparency. It's all about the information being there for everyone to see. So how do you reconcile the tension there? Uh, I think there are many ways in, in which to do that. There are things in which you can encrypt the data so that only the right people can see the data. It's still there, but only accessible to, to, to those who need to know, for example, governments. So I think that's an interesting tension. And finally, volatility um, in asset prices. You know, when you have a smart contract, there's, there's some value there. But how do you fix that if the prices keep going up and down? So I think that's a, an interesting area, and, and this is where maybe stable coins comes in, where um, uh, CBDCs come in as well. And finally, um, looking ahead, I mean, supply chain efficiencies, I think, is obvious. Um, it's really about time, resources, and friction. If people can uh, conclude their contracts easier with less people, less resources, then it's going to result in ho hopefully um, reduced costs and more money to put into more useful areas, um, such as existing infrastructure, building new infrastructure, et cetera. And I think that just generally, if we can make that ecosystem happen, um, there'll be increased trans transparency and trust. Um, Third, oh sorry, I realized the numbers are wrong there. Third, I think, as I said, we really welcome the Hong Kong government's recent policy announcement. I think looking ahead, that's going to be super interesting for uh, Hong Kong. And uh, we look forward to cooperating and, and collaborating with, with the government on their policies. Um, so I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to the questions during the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much. It appears that there's a lot of uh, very insightful sharing today from all the panelists. So uh, from the private sector standpoint, and also from the government that uh, we have a very comprehensive policy in place going forward. So uh, with this, perhaps I will start off to ask some of the questions. Actually, there's a question from the four in relation to the uh, regulation standpoint. Perhaps I will start off to ask uh, Under Secretary, Mr. Joseph, Mm, about this uh, question. So do you think that, um, I understand that the policy you just uh, in place is basically to promote Hong Kong to enter into this digital world. But do you think that the regulation will stifle the creative growth on the metaverse world? Thank you. Um, well, as I mentioned and also as set out in our virtual asset um, policy statement, we believe that the new technologies underpinning the virtual asset sector from DLT or Web 3.0 to the metaverse all have the potential to bring um, immense benefit to the financial sector and its clients. So to us, it's all about recognizing the potential of the technologies and embrace the benefits while identifying and also addressing and mitigating the risks and challenges as well. Um, we believe that the purpose of drawing these regulations, at least in the case of Hong Kong, is therefore to provide the necessary and suitable guardrails, as I mentioned earlier on, so that these new technologies and the applications can, can thrive in a vibrant yet uh, sustainable ecosystem. And in this regard, I would say that the regulations should be seen as a more complementary uh, rather than an opposing force to innovation and uh, creative growth. And from my experience as well, um, over the last few months, I have spoken with many uh, virtual asset players or um, STO issuers. Actually, from their perspective, they also share with us, look, they're actually looking for uh, regulations so that it will help induce confidence to the um, investors, to the customers, and to the professionals as well. And a lot of those that are serious players. Actually, they want to have a regulation, uh, regulation regime, certain criteria to distinguish between the real players who are willing to comply with the international standards in terms of KYC, uh, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, and those who cannot do that um, uh, because of the lack of scale or, or, or lack of capability. So that they welcome such a regime to help 
uh, promote the sustainable and responsible growth of the sector. So I do believe that um, as long as we can strike the right balance when we set out this regulatory, it should be in the long run very beneficial to the growth of this industry. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. Actually, there's a follow-up question from the four. Basically, he asks, is it possible for the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong to acquire cryptocurrency platform in order to increase the competitiveness of Hong Kong in the crypto market among the world? So what do you think about this? Well, uh, to begin with, um, I'm a policymaker, and I think this question touches on a commercial decision as well on the, of listed companies. <laughs> so I, I better not to uh, make a very direct comment on that. Uh, but what I would say um, is that at the moment, uh, in Hong Kong, there are over 10 uh, virtual assets um, exchanges operating already. And um, what we're doing is, as we introduce this licensing regime, uh, most of those told us they want to apply for the licensing regime. And with this licensing regime in place, and these over 10 exchanges continue to operate here in Hong Kong, I think we are already forming a uh, very sustainable and healthy ecosystem in that aspect. Um, if you ask me in the long run how the virtual access business will evolve or in the long run whether there will be more um, consolidation or so, I, I, I don't have the crystal ball here, but I can assure you that we'll continue to monitor the development of the, uh, uh, of the business. And as I mentioned early on, uh, we need to put up uh, the guardrails um, uh, timely. Uh, on a timely manner to facilitate the growth of the business while protecting, uh, protecting investors as well. Thank you, Joseph. So, Hon, you are from the private sector. What do you think? You can speak more then. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I've never actually considered this question, actually. Um, but you know, perhaps I shouldn't say too much, but I mean, I, I don't see why not. Uh, I think that the um, crypto exchanges would need to organize themselves um, slightly more maturely in terms of kind of how they're currently set up. I think there's a, there's a few things that, that the industry as a whole needs to do. Um, I'm, I'm sure stock exchanges would, would look into that um, very carefully. But, um, you know, as a concept, I don't see why not. But I think it may be early days for that. Um, I think we need to see how the sector develops, what the regulations look like um, before we get into that. Okay, thank you, Hon. So let's ask a question about from an international perspective. So William, so what if one party is subject to unnatural and unitary rules and the other isn't? So what will you do then? Thank you for the question. So it will be a relatively rare circumstance where you had two parties to international commercial contract where you would have one uh, subject to the principles of national commercial contracts or the CISG and one not because in the vast majority of circumstances they apply where the, there has been a choice of law agreement within the contract in relation to you know, the, the, the parties to this contract agree to apply principles of international commercial uh, contracts or the CISG. The CISG can also apply under the, the rules of that treaty where uh, both uh, the, the, the two um, Parties to a dispute are both located in contracting states um, that have, uh, and, and, and both separately contracting states. So usually the, the issue of applicability of the principles of international commercial contracts comes up when you have a dispute and it goes before the court and the court has to decide whether to apply the party autonomy clause in the contract um, and, in, and, and whether the, the choice of law rules in that forum allow the application of a non-state-based uh, set of rules, the, the union of our principles, or, or not. And in many cases, they won't. In international arbitration, it is more likely that uh, the, uh, a, a choice of law clause in, in a contract between in, for in, an international commercial contractor will be upheld. I think what might be interesting uh, quickly for me to reflect on in relation to this panel is that our ongoing work in relation to digital assets, which I, I emphasise is ongoing, it's not complete, but they've uh, currently principle five of the draft uh, principles on digital assets talks about conflict of law rules in relation to digital assets um, and they necessarily have to take in, taken a fairly innovative approach given the, the transient transborder nature of these assets. And currently, the Principle 5 takes a waterfall approach where uh, the, the applicable law will be either A, 
the law, actually the uh, choice of law set out in the, the digital asset itself, and that's actually encouraging, it's almost a forward-looking proposal trying to encourage uh, the creators of these digital assets to try to enshrine that in the digital assets itself. If that doesn't apply, the second step is uh, the, law, uh, the law selected by the issuer or the uh, central registry of, of, a, of a digital asset to the extent that exists. And if, again, one and two don't apply because there's neither of uh, neither of neither the digital asset nor the issuer has made such a selection. The third rule is essentially the conflict of law rules applicable uh, in, the, in the forum in which the dispute has occurred. So this is a, quite an innovative approach, quite a new approach, um, and we haven't quite finished the, this, this project yet, but that's, that's the uh, approach that's been adopted by the international group of experts negotiating the instrument up to now. Thanks, William. I see that very, very insightful. Thank you. So perhaps I now ask a more technical question to the uh, Department of Justice. So, uh, Dr. Ding, so we, will there be an import and export issues for digital assets that parties need to take into account? Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, that's a very practical issue, I think. When dealing with a case about import and export of digital assets, I think the first questions it should be, as I mentioned in my presentation, characterizations of the digital assets. There must be a conversion of mind on what the parties means by the import and export of the digital assets. Um, because uh, there could be different ways of categorizations. And as I just mentioned in my presentations, for a data contract, Ancestral has attempted to divide uh, data provision contract and also data processing contracts. So there could be different types of contracts that um, I think the parties or the, the lawyer advising the parties should make a distinction of. And the other important question is about applicable law. Um, so what should be the applicable law in such a case? And there may be some consideration about the conflict of law rules, choice of law, and also, as I mentioned, the CISG, the Conventions on International Sale of Goods, does the convention apply in such cases? Would in that particular, case, but that particular case, whether the CSG applies. So these are all the relevant considerations that the parties should take into account or the lawyers should advise them. And even if the CSG is applicable, the lawyers may also advise the clients whether in that particular case, whether it's necessary to opt out the application of CSG because that's permissible under CSG. So these are all different considerations that the parties should take into account. Thank you, Dr. Ding. So, as you can see that uh, our film this year is called Money on the uh, Fair and Roll. So I would like to refer this question to Horn. Horn, so as you can see that in the last couple of days, there's uh, quite a big news in this metaverse market. So do you see that on this market is now for the investment is still very immature or very volatile? So how do you see, it? and as an investor, what is your advice to that? Yeah, it's a... Obviously, I can't offer any financial advice. That's just, you know, let's be clear on that. Um, but I think, you know, what I maybe can comment on is just, I think, the general sentiment and maybe the direction of, of, of what's happening. Um, you know, generally in, in you know, we, uh, Rodin, we spoke about it um, just before the session about just general technology situation and what's been happening with technology companies, you know, predominantly from Silicon Valley. There's, there's a bit of a consolidation going on and, um, and a bit of a pivot, let's say. Um, and a lot of companies are figuring out how to get into the Web3 world, what that means for them, um, what does Web3 itself mean, um, what is the metaverse. I think these are just, for me, exciting questions to, to ponder and, and actually execute against. But I think we're in a very, very early stage of what that looks like. You know, when if you asked yourself maybe... 20 years ago, you know, what is the internet? Um, you know, you could give a reasonably educated answer maybe, but you probably wouldn't be able to imagine how it's being used today and, and, and what the future would look like. So I think it's difficult to imagine what the metaverse and Web3 would look like now, but part of the excitement is, is the unknown, is to build it. And I guess with the question about the market sentiment, um, there is, as new things develop, I think regulations will catch up, and I hope it does. Um, that's, 
you know, as a lawyer by trade as well, um, it's exciting to see the law evolve. Um, and I think once that, um, once that happens, you have a very good framework, a very consistent and safe framework in which to operate and, and, gener and, and, and generate innovation. Um, so right now we're in this space where we're kind of in between. Um, we'll get to a place where actually it's a little bit more settled and, and that's when, you know, hopefully more innovation will, will happen. Thank you, Juan. So actually I have a number of questions I want to ask the panelists, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, I must ask one question, because this is from our president, Mr. C.M. Chen. <laughs> so he, I'm not quite sure whether the president, which panelist we want to ask, but anyway, the question is, how do we identify the originating and beneficial owner of virtual assets from regulators or service providers' real funds? So is any panelist, um, Mr. Peston, you want to ask? <laughs> Anyone? Thank you. So if I, I get, if I get the question correctly, you're talking about how to identify the ultimate owner right, of the assets. Um, well, the, on, on one hand, of course, the technology of DLT and blockchain is decentralized right? The, uh, uh, in terms of framework. But on the other way around, as we set our regulations for uh, the virtual asset service provider to operate here, as I mentioned earlier on, we need to uh, apply the same activity, same risk, same regulation principle, uh, uh, meaning that for the moment, let's say for financial institutions, banks, securities, they are subject to KYC, no customers. So we will require the um, licensed virtual asset service providers to also have the same compliance with KYC, no customers as well. Uh, in fact, these are also requirements for anti-money laundering and counter-test financing as well. Uh, if, in fact, if you look at our current legislative proposal, uh, currently under scrutiny by LegCo, uh, the title or the name of that legislative proposal is exactly about uh, money laundering and counter-terrorist financing. So um, I think, I hope that explains to you that, okay, maybe the technology would in, uh, in, include a, um, an element of uh, not showing the name of the ultimate owner or so, but I think by the proper regulations through the process or through the licensed players with KYC or the way they interact with traditional financial um, institutions who need to know the source of funds, then through this different aspect, eventually we could identify uh, who are the owners subject to the KYC and the uh, risks that I mentioned earlier on. And uh, one last thing I want to say, uh, since we are on this topic, is that it's actually also some sort of requirement by Financial Action Task Force uh, under, under G20. Um, so that it's not only Hong Kong working alone. As we drafted our uh, um, licensing regime for the virtual assets uh, service providers, we also make reference to the guideline published by Financial Action Task Force as well. So while we do not have a completely or universally agreed definition on digital asset per se, uh, still I do think the regulators globally uh, are, and the governments globally are working together to mitigate and uh, address the risks that would arise uh, from these type of activities. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. So I think uh, we are now time. So on this note, so I thank all the panelists for all this insightful sharing and I hope all the participants today can have all this uh, insightful sharing with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tong, and thank you, esteemed panelists. Very thought-provoking conversations. May I now invite Mr. Tong to present souvenirs to our guests.
I'm sure we all had a lot of very useful takeaways from all the sessions today. May we now invite Mr. Fred Khan, Chairman of the Belt and Road Conference Organizing Committee of the Law Society of Hong Kong, to share with us some closing remarks. Mr. Khan, please. Mr. President, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasant duty to thank the speakers at the opening ceremony, as well as all moderators and panelists for the four sessions. Two on regulating the metaverse and two on money on the Bell and Road. These are important topics of the day. The metaverse is a virtual world that connects the physical and the digital worlds. It may be a dominant aspect of the future of mankind. Proper regulation of the metaverse may mean putting our future in proper order. At this conference, we just heard um, about the desirability of a metaverse convention. Hong Kong is an international city. Hong Kong is an international financial center. Hong Kong is a bridge. Hong Kong may well be in a good position to promote such a meta metaverse convention. Money on the Bell Road. Money in the form of currency is a bloodline of economies. Currency and trade are intertwined. Bearing in mind the vulnerability of many economies, we have endeavor to tackle the issue of a neutral global currency which may become pressing in a world plagued with conflicts. This has indeed been the most scintillating exploration of the topics under discussion. I have the feeling of having gone to a bountiful, bountiful banquet, but strange enough, I still hunger for more. In the first Bell and Road Conference held on 12 May 2017, 39 lawyers association from 24 jurisdictions signed the Hong Kong Manifesto, promoting legal cooperation between lawyers from the Bell and Road regions. In the second Bell and Road Conference held on 28th September, 2018, 34 lawyers associations signed the Law Tech Alliance, promoting a shared ethical AI framework between lawyers from the Bell Road regions. Although no formal document is signed at this fifth Bell Road conference, the tradition of forging cooperation and using the conference as a springboard for international interaction and discussion on pressing issues for the future still stands firm. The Law Society of Hong Kong commits itself to this goal. The Bell Road Conference will always be an intellectual well from which we all come to replenish ourselves. For on behalf of the organizing committee, I thank the Department of Justice for their great support, financial and otherwise, for including this conference as part of Legal Week. I also thank the Commonwealth Lawyer Association and Law Asia for being our sponsors. Before I declare, 
the fifth Bell and Road Conference ends, I shall be remiss if I do not thank Mr. Nick Chen, the chairman of the paper committee and members of his committee for coming up with such a fantastic program. I thank them and other members of the organizing committee from the bottom of my heart. I must also thank the Law Society Secretariat for its unyielding dedication and hard work. So, goodbye, good luck, good health to all of you, and see you all in person at the 6th Bone Road Conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. On behalf of the Law Society of Hong Kong, we want to say a big thank you for all of, us, all of you joining here physically and virtually. We would also like to express our gratitude to the Department of Justice of the Hong Kong SAR government for the continuous support of the Law Society events. Hopefully, we'll see you all next year in our sixth Belt and Road Conference. Thank you.